Greetings, my name is Dave Mwangi and this is Sunrise. It's a walk through the Bible. The book of Zechariah, this is the second installment. We're dealing with chapter 8 to chapter 14. In the previous section, we saw Zechariah encouraging people on the and giving them assurances that God is supporting their efforts to rebuild the temple. On this particular section, God continues his encouragement. And it takes a bit different turn because this is the place where we see the vivid image of the apocalypse, of apocalyptic nature of the book of Zechariah. In chapter 8, we read, Again, the word of the Lord Almighty came to me. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I'm very jealous of Zion and I'm burning with jealousy for her. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will return to Zion and I will dwell in Jerusalem. We see God clearly in, shows his emotions or how he thinks of this rebuilt, rebuilt temple. And if we continue in chapter nine, where we'll find that there is this prophecy or an oracle and Especially when you read in verses 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Where else do we hear these scriptures? When Jesus is making the triumphant entry in Jerusalem, in the week of his passion or the week of his crucifixion. This is what we call typology, that something talked about in the Old Testament is repeated in its fullest form in the New Testament. So the question to ask is, at the time when Zechariah, Zechariah was talking about this, is that what Lily was talking about? You see, the Bible channels everything God is doing to a certain end. And therefore, all that the Bible does, all the stories, all the prophets, all, the, all that what happens around the Bible is toward, is roaring, toward, is snowballing toward a certain desired or God-desired end. And therefore, it is very possible that the prophet was speaking from two points. That yes, at this particular time when uh, the Jerusalem is being restored and the temple is being restored, under the leadership of Zerubbabel, who was, you know, a designate leader by the Persians or the, by the, uh, the Babylonians, but God, uh, Zechariah is seeing that this future is going to be realized, where we are going to have a king who is not as violent as the Babylonians. Remember, the image that is clear in their minds is how the Babylonians used to come with their chariots and violent. But this particular king that is coming to take over the leadership in the temple is going to be one who is coming in lowly and who is going to be preaching injustice. And on and on he goes in chapter 10 and continuing how people's lives will be transformed or how people should lead it with, to each other in fairness and in justice and in practicing you know, hospitality to their particular uh, neighbors because that's how God wants the new Jerusalem to look like. It's not a place for violence. And he says, I'm jealous about this. So he has put his best foot forward to make sure that what he wants accomplished is going to be accomplished. How he wants it done is going to be done the way he wants it done. He wants this place to be a place of tranquility. He wants this to be the center of worship. I said that the prophet is not confined to time. He doesn't see time in a linear way. So once you, as you are reading these particular chapters, you need to be able to see how the prophet rushes from the messianic hope to the, to the final end where God is actually coming with the trumpets in the book of Revelation. And then he comes back. That takes a whole lot of like over 2,000 years because even where we are right now, the end is not here. Yet it is talked about in the book of Zechariah because even if he is speaking from where he is, he is not confined in time. 
he can see through to the final end, to the final climax of what God intends uh, to, to happen. The book of Zechariah, as would, you would expect, has a lot of imagery and a lot of figures of speech. And a lot of people don't know what to do with those things. I have a couple of rules, or there are universally accepted rules of how to deal with the prophetic and apocalyptic books. And I, I'm going to share with you a few of them because they are going to be very, very vital as you go through the book of Zechariah. The first rule is literalism. That take the book to be as literal as it says. So, if the book says that Zechariah had a vision or had a dream, and he saw a person walking among a myrtle trees, that is exactly what he was seeing. There is no figure of speech there. The second rule is that if the first rule fails, try and go to the second one of, does what the other is saying represent something? Is it an image of something else? And so when you see uh, women flying, naturally women don't wake up and start flying. They don't have wings. While he could have been seeing a creature looking like that, it is not humanly possible for someone to fly. So it could be a representation of something. The third rule is called typology. Typology is applies to few books where what the author is talking about is going to appear, especially in the Old Testament, is going to be realized in the New Testament as a type. So, especially when it comes to talking about Christ, Christ is mirrored a lot in the Old Testament in symbolism or typology. But in the New Testament, we now see the actual person of Christ. And the book of Zechariah has a type of Christ. Actually, it is one of the book, few books that have, a lot, have been quoted a lot in the New Testament because of those typologies where it is referencing the Messiah who is coming. And so, from chapter 1 to chapter 8, we encounter Zechariah in a vision. And again, if I may add one other rule, it's that the prophet is a human being, even if he is an intermediary of God. He is a person born and who has lived among his people. Therefore, he will only speak from the context and the culture that he knows. For example, he is speaking a language that is culturally based. It is not heavenly. There is nothing heavenly about being Hebrew or, uh, or using the Jewish language. That is a culture that he grew up and that's the culture he knew. He is making references of things that his audience can relate with. Therefore, if he says that he saw a horse, his people can understand what a horse is. Otherwise, it would, be, it would not make any sense if he is talking about something that his audience doesn't know. And if he's talking about a ravine or a metal tree, it is a tree that is known. By, that, by those same audiences that he is speaking about. And if we come to that particular aspect, for example, it could be that there was a collective understanding of what a metal tree represents. And in this particular case, because it's a message of exhortation or encouragement to rebuild the temple, the people are able to see the serenity of a person, you know, walking in the evening, for example, or in a sundowner among the metal trees. They have colorful, if you have seen a metal tree, it's colorful, bright red, some of them are, are cream um, and white. But it's really a, 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 it is a symbolic of peace. It is symbolic of serenity or tranquility. And God has a message that he is going to restore the temple, he is going to restore Jerusalem to be that place of tranquility. Remember, that the civilization of the Jews revolved around the temple. It was their center of worship. It was their center of everything. And therefore, when God is restoring Jerusalem and God is encouraging the rebuilding of the temple, the people who are around Zechariah can see that this we are coming back home. We are coming back to that place where we used to love worshiping. We used to, we, we, this was the center of everything that we knew. 
and deed. And God is bringing it all together. And the people had become a bit lax because of the opposition that they had been facing around. And for your information, when you are reading the book of Zechariah, it's good to make references to Ezra and Nehemiah, where you see some of the narratives about the construction of the temple and the wall being um, narrated very, 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 very clearly. So Zechariah is encouraging people. Again, Zechariah is a voice of God. He's a mouthpiece for God. But he uses his context to communicate this message. He is very, very artistic. And for example, how he sees these visions, in, 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 we would say that um, he sees the vision. In first, he sees visions, eight visions. And the first ones, we have a horse person, a, horse, a, a person riding a horse. On the eighth vision, we still have chariots. And it is called chiastic, something that looks like this, where he will start somewhere here, and the first one will relate to the last one, the second one will relate to the second last, and vice versa, all the way to where it culminates to the worship. And on and on he goes, and what finally we see towards uh, chap uh, verse, uh, chapter 6 is actually the kingdom, uh, the, the temple is restored, and we even have an installed priest who is now um, supervising or leading the worship. And when you read this, you realize that God is very much interested in bringing a restoration for worship. Now, how do we see typology in this uh, book of, uh, in this particular section? It is because God is not just interested with the restoration of the physical building or the physical or the political leadership as we see in Zerubbabel. God is interested with restoring the people's hearts. And when you read the book of Zechariah on these particular chapters, ask yourself, how is God restoring you? For example, God is using, or the people who are building the temple were using inanimate objects. They were using stones and wood to reconstruct the temple. The typo represented here in the future is that God in the book, uh, in, the, in the New Testament, talks about we are being built into a temple where God will dwell in us. But we are not inanimate, we are human beings. So in the type that Zechariah is talking about, while it is true that it happens at that particular point, in the New Testament, the typology is that God is using you as building blocks of a temple that he can live and dwell in. And God is bringing us to that point of centrality of worship. Finally, think about it this way, that the prophet doesn't, is not confined in the linear time. And sometimes the prophet will speak about items happening now while he can see them in the far-flung future. And when we come to next week, we'll discover how he talks about the Messiah and he talks a lot about it as if it's happening that particular point while those things recur in the near future or in the far future. Because in, prof, um, in, in the prophet, we do not have one person who is confined in time. He is not restricted to what he can see because he is seeing visions far beyond what that particular time entails. Thank you and God bless you.